everybody. Um, most of you already know our speaker, but I like um, our, I like to welcome you to the the virtual pre computation of biology seminar series. Third, uh, we have today the pleasure to have uh, Alan Bridge, um, who is a biologist uh, by training with the research experience in molecular and cell biology, and uh, now is working as a, as a scientific database curator at Kiss Squad at his uh, Kiss Institute of Bioinformatics in Geneva. Um, briefly, he, uh, Alan joined the CIB, CISPOT group at CIB in uh, Geneva in 2004, and um, where he worked as a bio-curator in the quality assurance department. In 2008, he became jointly responsible for the integration of all manually curated Unipod KB CISPOT entries. And uh, in 2009, he, uh, he was uh, made head of the Department uh, of Automation and, and, and Enhancement, uh, which groups all transversal uh, notation programs of the SwissPod group. So today, he's going to talk about one project, so Swiss Lipids, and he's going to talk about the vital role of biocurate in knowledge exploitation. Alan, the stage is yours. Um, so I'd like to uh, thank you all for coming uh, and for your, for your time. Um, what I'd like to do today is, uh, uh, as Diana said, I'd like to uh, talk to you today about a fairly new project that we have running in the CISPOT group, which is called Swiss Lipids. Um, I don't just want to describe this resource to you, though. What I'd like to do is actually uh, give you an insight into really how we built this resource. Um, so I'd like to talk about um, uh, what is bio-curation and, and why it's essential to building this kind of knowledge resources. Um, and I'd also like to talk about the synergies between uh, SIB and other groups. Uh, in this context, this was uh, actually a, a systems X project called Liquid X, okay? Hence the focus on lipids. Um, so, as Diana said, I'm working in the SwissPod group. Um, our focus really is on knowledge representation and bio-curation. Um, we have a sister group, if you like, here in Lausanne, which is called Vital IT. Um, so they're much more kind of, if you like, classic bioinformatics group. Um, they have a focus on computational infrastructure and uh, development of databases and algorithms. Um, so the project I'm going to talk to you today uh, about today, it's really one of the first uh, resources that we've developed together um, uh, between the two groups. Um, and I, I think it's a very nice example of the synergy between, uh, between us today. Um, so what's bio-curation? Uh, so the, the, the problem is very simple, if you like. I mean, there's a, uh, an ever-increasing body of, of published uh, data about biology uh, in the life sciences. Um, if you look on PubMed, there's more than 20 million papers now counted. But the issue with scientific publications is that, um, uh, which, is, which is still the main medium, if you like, of scientific communication. And this is a form of communication which is, if you like, free text or prose. Um, so this is, it's very nice for people to read. It provides a nice story about a research project or a, or a particular problem. Um, but it's very hard to extract knowledge from this, this prose automatically or computationally. So bio-curation is really about getting the knowledge out of the literature and structuring it in such a way as it can be uh, searched okay, and rediscovered, if you like. Uh, so what bio-curators do is they really synthesize and structure the knowledge that, that experts put into prose. Um, they tag it with identifiers, for instance, the proteins or chemical entities or clues. Uh, the Yuval College uses the control vocabulary to do that. Uh, and really, as I said, the idea is to make public knowledge much more easy to discover and read. Um, and the project that I'm going to talk to you uh, about today, um, it really has this as, as one of the overriding goals. It's to make knowledge easier to discover and to reuse. And in the context of this project, um, it's, it's knowledge and data from, from a, a systems X project called Liquid X. Um, so the bio-curation activities uh, that we have at SwissPot, historically, we've been involved in a lot of resource development for the life science community at large. Um, Diana alluded to, to this resource, which is Uniprot, which is one of the resources which we've developed now over decades. It's a resource of protein sequences and functional annotation. Um, around Uniprot, we also develop a number of complementary or uh, specialized resources, like, for instance, HAMAP, which is a resource of protein uh, families and annotations for those, and ProSight, which is similar to HAMAP, but for protein domains. Um, and we 
that to use these resources to actually annotate participants within the report. Um, another resource which we developed is a, a specialized resource called Viral Zone, which is a little bit like Uniport, but with a, a special split for, for viral viruses. Um, so historically, we've really focused on protein sequences. Uh, more recently, we started to get more into chemistry and biochemistry. Um, one of the resources I'll talk about today in the context of, of this project is a, a resource called REACT. And this is a database of biochemical reactions. Um, and we've actually used this resource, REA, uh, in the generation of, of our new split physics research. Okay, so I'll talk about how we leverage our existing activities uh, to generate new resources. Um, and the synergies involved there with other projects like this again. Thank you. Um, so as I said, this is a, it's like a, a collaboration between ourselves and, and the sequence and, and the sequence X uh, project. Um, Ipid X is about sequence biology of biomembranes and reading lipids at large. Within Lipid X, there's a variety of different groups who use different approaches to study lipids. Uh, some of these are experimental, like this is mass spectrometry. Um, so this is a mass spectrometer. There are also some groups doing computational analysis of lipids or modeling of lipids. So we have metabolic modeling. Um, and this is particularly for Philly, down here. Uh, these groups, they study a variety of lipids with a variety of biological roles. Um, so we have, uh, obviously, roles of membrane formation. Um, so this is a classic membrane forming lipid. Uh, I'll come back to this uh, kind of structure quite a lot during this course. Um, if you don't like chemical structures, I'm sorry, but this course is really more suited to your taste. Um, but I want to point out some of, the, some of the main features of these kind of molecules. So forming membranes, we, we basically have two domains. We have a hydrophilic domain for this molecule and a fairly hydrophobic domain. Uh, these hydrophobic domains tend to pack, so that these, these molecules will form bilayers uh, with the head sticking out at, at either end of, of the fatty acid oriented towards the fish. Uh, lipids have roles also as energy stores. Obviously, there's a, a great interest in, in studying lipids uh, with respect to human health and metabolic diseases. So if you eat too much of the wrong kind of food, it will play havoc with your energy stores. And uh, the effects of that will be apparent uh, when you walk down the street. So this is a triethylcyclerol. Um, and lipids also have roles in signaling. So this particular molecule here um, actually controls aging. So the dosage of this particular molecule this organism, which is C. elegans, it will actually control the rate at which the organism ages. Um, so I'll come back uh, to lipid structures uh, throughout this talk. Um, lipid X people, they study lipids, uh, they study all these different kinds of lipids in a variety of biological systems, uh, including human, uh, worm, and yeast. <coughs> so what I want to do uh, in this talk is to uh, focus on how lipids are studied. So the methodologies that people use to study lipids and how they annotate their data. Um, I want to focus on some of the difficulties in, in annotating the data, uh, which, which these technologies like mass spectrometry introduce. Um, and also the difficulties of integrating this kind of data with, for instance, uh, metabolic models or metabolic maps for doing computational analysis. Um, so this is, this is a problem which we've tried to address Uh, so to explain how lipids are studied, um, I use this kind of cartoon uh, representation of really the inner workings of this kind of machine. So the idea is um, we'd like to study a biological sample and describe it in terms of its lipid composition. Um, we can inject the sample into the machine. Uh, we can ionize it. Uh, and then the machine contains three different cells, which allow us to either scan and detect the mass of the corresponding ion or separate that ion and detect the masses of the fragments. So this gives us a kind of characteristic spectrum where we have what's called a precursor ion, which is the intact lipid, and we have a variety of products. Okay. Now, based on what the spectrum looks like, we can piece these elements together, kind of like a jigsaw, and try to figure out what the lipid might have been. Okay. But there's a lot of inferencing that goes on, uh, and there's a lot of assumptions in, in the way the data is annotated. Um, so this gives you kind of a high-level uh, view of the lipidome of an organism in general. Um, but people like this because uh, you can study dozens, if not hundreds, of lipids in a single biological sample using these kind of technologies. So most lipidologists estimate uh, that there are probably tens, if not hundreds of thousands of lipids whoops, uh, in a UK 
choice of the predominant. Um, so doing these kind of high-level surveys is now very popular within systems X, but also um, within a lot of other projects. Um, so we started to work with people uh, in Liquid X um, in 2013, which is when the project was started. Um, so what I'll, I'll do is I'll show you how first how the data is kind of annotated and some of the problems that are associated with that annotation. Um, then I'll show you how we try to address those um, using our kind of curation activity. So if you imagine a biological sample, and it has three different lipid structures in it, which we saw here. So here we have, if you like, the head on this side, and here we have the different tails. Um, you can see that these three molecules all have the same head. Um, so they're based on a glycerol, they have a phosphate, and a choline. Uh, so that means they're a phosphatidyl alcoholine. Okay? Same backbone, but different fatty acids. Um, so they're all PCs, but they all have different fatty acids. Uh, so this notation tells you what the fatty acids are. So the first of these figures is the number of carbons in the fatty acid. Um, I'm going to check my pointer. Um, the second of these figures tells you the number of double bonds. And I'll tell you why that's important in a minute. And when you have this kind of notation, it tells you where the double bond is and how it's arranged. Um, so this is kind of interesting and, and very important to the people who study these lipids. So if you have different degrees of unsaturation and different bond positions, that will affect the physical and chemical properties of these lipids. And that will have an impact on the membrane itself. Um, I also told you that lipids have roles in signaling. Um, and these fatty acids themselves can be signaling molecules. So the membrane is actually a source of secondary messages. Okay? Um, so this particular lipid here, it has a 16 carbon fatty acid in position one. Uh, it has an 18 carbon fatty acid in position two. Uh, and this fatty acid, it has one double bond. This double bond's in position nine, and it has Z configuration with three groups of lipids. So that means the, the, the two groups are pointing out the same way. So the effect that that has on the molecule is a big kind of pink. And the molecule and uh, the, the, the membrane which contains this molecule will be kind of less saturated. So it will be uh, a little bit more fluid. So that's what this notation means. It's telling you uh, what are the fatty acids, how many double bonds, where they're positioned. So you can see these two lipids, um, they have the same fatty acids, but they're swapped around. And this one has different fatty acids, so it has little in common with the other two. So let's imagine we have these three lipids in our biological sample, and we decide to different that by mass spec using the platform of Liquid X or any other liquidometer platform. Um, so I told you that. Um, hang on a minute. So I told you that um, we can fragment these molecules, and we can look at the fragments. Um, so depending on how these molecules fragment, we can get more or less structural information about the underlying uh, lipids. So if we were to fragment, uh, fragment the head, that would tell us that we have a phosphatidylcholine, so we lose this part. And all we know really is the sum composition of what's on the left. So we have a very high level view of these lipids. Okay? And this is the kind of level that lipid X is normally looking at. So your data annotation would look something like this. Uh, we would seem to have one lipid in the sample, and we'd lose information about the three structures. Um, if we followed a different experimental protocol and we had a different form of ionization or a different form of collision, uh, we might get fragments corresponding to the fatty acids. So by a process of elimination or subtraction, you know that if you have a 16 and you know the total mass of the fatty acids, then you have an 18 and a 1 on the other side. But you don't know how they're really distributed. So this gives you a little bit more detail. So now you know that these two, uh, so these two different structures correspond to, to one annotation. And we can now distinguish those two from this one. So we think we have two lipids in our sample. Um, and if we can fragment them, whoops, uh, if we can fragment them in such a way that we can control the positioning, and we can know the, uh, the actual position on the glycerol backbone of the fatty acids, then we can get a more detailed annotation, which tells us the composition of the fatty acids and where they actually are. So we know now that we have three different lipids, uh, but we still don't know what the structures are because we're still missing the information about where this bond is. Okay? Um, we know these three are now different, but we still don't exactly know what they are. Now, the interesting thing about lipids is that the people who study them, um, they often have years of training in biochemistry, and they can look at these kind of annotations, and they'll tell you straight away what the structure is likely to be. So if you say PC34 to somebody 
234 one for some of the illiquid X. And they'll say, well, yeah, I know it's probably uh, 16018119Z because um, they have the history and the biochemistry to tell them that. So this is not something that a novice uh, can tell you. And it's also not something a machine can tell you. Okay, so there's no database which is, which is really uh, providing possible structures for these kind of power flows. So what we try to do um, is try to make this a little bit more explicit. So to summarize what I just said, if we have um, a biological sample with three different lipid structures, um, if we have three different kinds of uh, fragmentation protocol that we're using, some of them will make these lipids appear as one or two different molecules or sometimes even three, uh, but we can't get the resolution, we can't get the structural information. So this would have to be with the technologies like NMR. Um, so this kind of notation of uh, what we call lipid species or fatty acid scan or subspecies was actually published uh, during this project um, by a group in, in, in Germany and Austria. So we have this kind of collapsing of uh, data into, into the individual points. Um, <clears throat> so as I said, lipid biologists are often they don't consider this a problem. For them, P234-1, uh, they know that in their biological sample, they can figure out what the structure is immediately just by, by that annotation. Um, but it's not uh, immediately apparent to somebody who's not familiar with the data, and it's also not apparent to a machine. There's also a related problem, um, which is similar to this kind of hiding of structures under a, a single annotation, is that apparently different lipids can share components. So as I was saying, um, if, you, if you show PT341 for somebody in lipid X, they'll immediately tell you what the structure is. Um, also, if you show them these kind of annotations, they'll probably tell you what the structures are for those as well, just, just by background knowledge. Um, but again, there's some kind of hidden information. Because um, if you look at the most common structures for these, you can often find common elements. So if you consider uh, these three lipids, the, the next three on the list, um, they have three different classes, three different sets of carbons, three different sets of double bonds. Uh, in principle, they don't have anything in common, but if you look at the most common structures which would correspond to these annotations, you can see, for instance, these two uh, share a fatty acid. They share the 16. Uh, these two share the 1819Z. Uh, um, these two share a head group. Uh, these two share a backbone, and so on. So there's a lot of hidden links in this data. Um, as I said, people doing lipidomics analysis, they often have this kind of natural reflex of knowing this kind of stuff. But when you look at published data or you try to um, map this to models and so on, this isn't, isn't uh, explicitly captured. So the issues with the kind of lipidomics that people are doing, the kind of technologies they're using, um, is that it provides a data annotation where the notation that's used, it requires an expert to interpret it. So figuring out what the links might be between different data points, it requires somebody who knows the chemistry. And at least when we started this project, we didn't know the chemistry, and we found the whole thing extremely confusing. Um, there's also a problem of mapping this kind of data to, to knowledge bases and models. Um, so one thing about LipidX is there's a computational element. Um, there are other systems X projects which also do lipidomics where they like to map that data to models. Um, and this is not really apparent. So what does PT341 have to do with a pathway in a database like Unicot or KEG? Um, it's not very easy to map those data types together. Uh, there's also an issue of the comprehensiveness of the individual knowledge. Um, so the way LipidX works is, is like many lipidomics platforms. They have a reference list of lipids that they study. These are defined by the researchers within the project. And these are what they scan, and these, uh, these are the terms in which they define their biological system. Okay, by increases or decreases in these lipid species. Um, but it could be that there's other lipids that they could also be looking at. So these could be lipids that share common elements or, or, or similar fatty acids and so on. Okay. Um, so these are issues that are not really specific to LipidX. They apply to any lipidomics platform that works in this way. Um, and these are some of the issues which we tried to address in this project working with the people in LipidX. Um, so, as I'll show you in the, in the resource that we built, what we tried to do was make, to make this kind of notation transparent, um, to make explicit relations between these different kind of concepts. We wanted the mapping uh, of the data to, to models and pathways to be complete. Uh, and as I'll show you, what we effectively did was to reverse engineer um, the 
analytical output from knowledge of pathways. And we wanted uh, the resource to be comprehensive. Okay, so rather than relying on individual people's knowledge of a few lipids, what we wanted to do was to effectively use our curation power, if you like, um, to take all the knowledge of lipid structures from the, from the literature and use that to build, um, to build a resource which would have all possible lipid structures uh, for lipids of interest to people um, working in lipid X and, and elsewhere. Okay. <coughs> so the, the idea is very simple. Um, as I said, it's basically kind of a reverse engineering. So we use the resources that we're working on already. So we leverage the activities that, that we already have in place. Um, and we start by curating metabolic pathways. Uh, so anything that, that relates to the lipids of interest in people in lipid X, we go back to the primary literature and we curate all the biochemistry that we can find about those lipids. What that gives us is it gives us a catalog of building blocks, like I said, with heads and tails, fatty acids and, and class. Um, and it also gives us a set of rules for how these things are known to combine. Okay. Um, so this was something like a total of 450 papers that we, we read to build the uh, catalog and, and, and rules. So we then enumerate all the possible structures of lipids which might exist. So this runs into the, the tens and hundreds of thousands, as you might imagine. We have a lot of combinations of fragments. Um, and we then rebuild uh, the analytical output for mass spectrometry from those structures. We organize the lipids in a hierarchical structure, uh, which corresponds to the kind of analytics that people do in mass spec. So we, we in, in effect, we rebuild the list of lipids that, that lipid X is, is looking at, but from the structures. Um, so what we can now do, so we do all that programmatically, and that gives us a framework for describing and curating and, and exploring lipid data. Uh, so the curation, it begins with RIA. So we start by building all the possible reactions, linking them to lipids. That goes in the Swiss Lipids database. That also contains the rules and all the fragments uh, and all the resulting structures in the hierarchy. And then once we built this, we map it onto the lipids of lipid X. So we regenerate their hierarchy. And hopefully, we regenerate not only all the lipids that lipid X is studying, but a lot of other lipids which perhaps they should be studying uh, on top of those. <coughs> so to explain how we did this, um, I need to show you a little bit more detail on, on RIA. Some of the other resources we're working on. Um, <clears throat> so RIA, it's a, a curated resource of biochemical reactions. It's a resource we've been developing for now about seven years. Um, it's developed as a collaboration between SID and, and EBI. Um, it currently contains around seven and a half thousand reactions, which are curated from literature, and from about three thousand four hundred publications. <coughs> So we originally developed RIA actually as a vocabulary for describing biochemistry in, in Uniproc. Um, so currently, if you look in a Uniproc record, you have a textual representation of the reaction. Okay, so the biochemistry is defined in, in words. What we'd like to have is a more structured representation with complete chemistry. Um, so I'll show you a little bit more about RIA in a moment. Uh, another thing I want to say about RIA is that it's also used in the Metanet X uh, Systems X project. Um, so this is a project for model reconstruction. This is um, the website is run by Marco Pagni at Michael IT. Um, and RIA actually provides, if you like, a namespace for biochemical reactions within that project. Okay. Um, so by using RIA to build our lipid database, what we have is a way of linking MetanetX and LipidX and, and other systems X projects. Um, so about 20% of the, the contents of RIA was actually generated uh, specifically for this project. It was funded, uh, funded by this, um, this system X. So to show you how we represent metabolism in RIA, <coughs> um, each reaction has a unique identifier. Each of the components in a reaction has a, uh, an explicit structural representation. Um, so this can be at varying levels of ambiguity. So a little bit like we have different levels of detail in mass spectrometry data, we often have different levels of detail in biochemical data as well. So sometimes people will do biochemistry without really knowing uh, the structure of the molecules they're working on. So they might know that they're working on a class of lipids, uh, and they're converting one class of lipids to another class of lipid, but they don't know the precise structure. Uh, in this particular example, you have a lipid which is a 1-acyl something, becomes a 1-2-diacyl something. 
So what that means is there's a fatty acid attached here. We don't know it's precise structure. Uh, so it's represented by this notation R, R1. So that's uh, what's called a marker for this thing. Uh, so we have placeholders for the fatty acid. We know there's a fatty acid there. We don't know exactly what it is. So we can represent this kind of ambiguity in this way. Um, the structures that we use are taken from an ontology called KEBI. So the people we collaborate with on the RIA database, they develop this, this ontology called KEBI that has something like 40,000 different structures in it. Okay. And it's a, it's a manually curated thing called the, the KEBI thing. About 10% of the structures in there were, were submitted by ourselves. Um, so we can define metabolism using KEBI. We, uh, we can uh, describe biochemical reactions. As I said, uh, uh, this is being used in projects for describing reactions in metabolic models. Uh, one of the reasons it's suitable for that, one of the things that makes it especially suitable is that all the reactions are bound, actually. So we have a checking of the, uh, the atomic balance of the reaction. Um, so on the left, the right, you'll see that the number of atoms uh, are the same. So there's no gain or loss in that. Um, we have links to other resources like, for instance, the enzyme classification down here at the bottom of IUBMB, uh, TEG, Metabike, and, and Cupex. Um, so, something I wanted to mention about RIA is, as I said, we can describe the biochemistry at different levels of ambiguity. Um, so, KEBI, as I said, it's an ontology. So, there are, there are different classes of compound and there are instances of classes. Um, so, in the preceding instance, we were talking about a particular class of reaction, and in this particular reaction, it's an instance. Okay, so now we specify what structures are. So, we can talk about individual molecules changing from one to another. Um, as well as classes. So here we have classes, and here we have instances of those classes. So it's quite a flexible system for curating information um, about lipids or really any other molecule. So this is uh, how we started building the specific database. Uh, we really went back to first principles, so we did uh, targeted curation of all the pathways um, by which these classes of molecules can interconvert. So this is a little extract from uh, from the crystal of phospholipids. So these are based on glycerol. So we have a glycerol backbone with a phosphate. Um, so we can see that heads can interconvert, uh, fatty acids can be added and removed, fatty alcohols, and so on and so forth. Um, so we did uh, systematic curation of all the pathways by which these molecules interconvert. Those are the heads. These are the tails. Um, so we can elongate. This is a two carbon unit all the way to 38 carbon fatty acids having up to six double bonds. So there's something like 80 to, to 90 fatty acids which are really known in nature. Um, so we curated all the pathways which would allow us to synthesize and break this down. So just for uh, the synthesis, there's something like 200 reactions which would drive the synthesis of fatty acids. Um, we have different classes of fatty acid, like if you look at these, there's um, the, fir the first of the double bonds from the omega end is um, six carbons away. So these are the omega-6 fatty acids. Uh, these are the omega-3 fatty acids. And what you often see in nature is these can interconvert, but only in certain animals. So, for instance, humans can't do a lot of these interconversions. You have to eat these omega-3 fatty acids. Um, but some people have done interesting experiments where, for instance, they engineer pigs using C. elegans enzyme to make healthier bacon, which is omega-3. So there's some kind of interesting research going on in, in fatty acid biosynthesis, um, which is a little unexpected. So, um, for the for the LipidX project, we did, uh, as I said, systematic and targeted curation of um, lipid metabolic pathways. This gives us a very large catalog of building blocks. So some of them are shown here. So, for instance, if we consider glycerol, it has uh, three positions at which it can attach other groups. These can be fatty acids or fatty alcohols or head groups. The numbers tell you how many uh, uh, fatty acids or fatty alcohols are used in glycerol. Uh, for glycerolipids or um, glycerol phospholipids with one of these head groups. Um, so we have specific, specific rules for how these things can combine. So for instance, you can add an alcohol uh, to the first position, but not to the others. That's what's seen through the nature. Um, you can, uh, we limited the number of fatty acids in the glycerolipids because these are generally storage lipids. So we, we removed all the very, very long chain polyunsaturated fatty acids, because they're generally found in a restricted number of tissues. So we, we basically built rules which take into account not only the non-chemistry, but also the non-biology. Um, and then what we did is very simple. We just enumerated all the possible structures. 
Um, so we have a library of fragments, which we call Master Kebi. So these are the tails and these are the heads. And by combining them according to the rules we defined, we could generate all possible different code groups in the next class. So we did that computationally. Um, and that gave us around uh, 240,000 different code groups. So what we, what we then did uh, is we, an well, we annotated them. So we can say for each molecule, uh, how does it map to Kebi? What's its class and what are its components? Um, we can generate a name. So there's a very uh, well-defined uh, nomenclature schema for the pig. So if you know these three things, uh, you, can you can derive a, a name automatically. Uh, we can provide cheminformatic descriptors, like a, a linear representations of the structure. Actually, that's how we build the thing. Um, so one of these is called the smiles representation. Another one is Inchi, which was developed by IUPAC uh, and NTP. These are extremely useful ways to, to represent structures, actually. Um, so the smiles, for instance, we can generate all possible representations of chemical structures from this. Like, for instance, this kind of uh, two-dimensional picture can be generated from this. Okay, so it's very flexible and easy to work with. Um, and in effect, the way we built this library is that we, we had um, catalogs of, of linear parts and special smiles, and, and we combined them together. Uh, this is an extremely useful representation, the inchy peak. Um, these are pretty much unique in any given structure. So what these allow you to do is to compare your structures to other pieces of database structures. So you can generate inchy keys for every, every uh, structure in your database, and then you can compare them to other pieces of databases to see how they stack up. So this is quite easy to do and it's quite handy. Um, so one of these, uh, this database here is called Lipid Map. That's a reference database which was developed in the US um, by, uh, set, by a consortium of people doing lipid audits, actually. Um, so what they provide is a database of structures, very much like this, which they say are all the lipids that occur in nature. So what we then do <coughs> is we have all our um, structural isomers. This is the base of the pyramid, if you like. And we use that to infer all the, all the um, mass spectrometry outputs which you would expect to find. Okay, so for this particular lipid which we just built, we can infer what its corresponding subspecies would look like, how it would appear in a mass spectrometer, what its fatty acid scan species would look like, and what its species would look like. So for 244,000 structures, we end up with about 5,000 species. So those are combinations of um, a particular class, a number of carbons, and a number of double bonds. Um, so what we can now do is we can now map data onto the structure. So we have a, a hierarchy. It's not, strictly speaking, an ontology, but it's very similar to an ontology. So we can map, for instance, data from lipid X onto this level. Or we can map uh, in vitro biochemical experiments with defined structures onto this level uh, and map spec data in between. Okay, so it allows us to, for instance, relate um, observations of where a lipid's been seen in the body using mass spec to the enzymes which are known to metabolize that lipid in vitro. Um, so, um, so we use this as a framework uh, for mapping lipid X. Uh, so for this particular class of lipids, which are phospholipids, we map 797 uh, of the lipids in lipid X to species. So we have a lot more species than are being looked at in, in the lipid X pipeline at the current time. What's interesting about this is that 635 of these um, could, be, uh, could be mapped to the structures which map to lipid map. Okay. So we can use this hierarchy to map from lipid X down and across to the lipid map database, which is a reference database of structures. So lipid maps could explain about 635 of the outputs that we see in lipid X. Um, but by doing this brute force enumeration approach, we could explain about 80 of them. And this is quite useful um, because we could also explain, for instance, uh, the metabolic pathways which might result in the, the, in the transitional breakdown of the lipids in, in lipid maps. Okay. So lipid maps is just a database of structures. There's no annotation, there's no pathways, there's no enzymes. Um, but as we've enumerated all the possible structures and then mapped them back to lipid maps, uh, we get a mapping of their data onto our pathways. Um, we can also annotate like uh, occurrences of these structures or other species in the literature. Um, what's interesting about that is that if you actually look for evidence, real evidence of structures in the literature, yeah. Um, so the people who produce lipids, uh, 
on that. They're, 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 they all exist. Um, but if you look for real evidence in literature, you'll find real evidence in a very small number. Um, so Ed Dennis, who was the boss of, of Lipid Map, um, actually I first met him in Singapore a couple of years ago at a, at a Lipid um, symposium. And um, he basically sells Lipid Map as the reference for everything that's real, kind of like Gitpro. Uh, but actually, it seems that if you oops, Uh, if you look at um, the structural data in there and you look for evidence in literature, you find very little evidence for those structures. But if you look at the number of lipids that Lipid X is looking at and which they have evidence for, uh, there must be at least 800 structures which exist, but nobody ever really characterized them. So if you think about it, there's a lot of biochemistry you could do in terms of characterizing lipid structures or doing NMR and really figuring out the stereochemistry, what connects to where, and which are the real fatty acids. Yeah. Um, so the number of species is much higher than the number of isomers which are really known. The number of isomers which lipid maps is, is claiming, you know, it stacks up pretty well, actually. Um, so I think there's a lot of scope for really explaining what lipid maps are doing. Um, so they're kind of experts. Most of these guys are in the 70s. They've been doing biochemistry since so they really know the stuff. Um, they build this database. Uh, they, they build this database um, computationally, um, and they sell it as as all the real liquid. But it, you know, it's it's not really true. Uh, but what we did, we tried to be very clear. We checked every possible combination. We build every possible combination, um, and then we can see, for instance, is there evidence in in Lipid X for structures for which there's no evidence in literature? <coughs> the answer is yes, there's a lot of evidence. <coughs> so there's a lot of structures to be figured out. Um, so I think this is something that's uh, really a common theme, <coughs> uh, to me at least, in systems biology, is that people are trying to describe biological systems, but we still don't really know what the parts are yet. Yeah. Um, so there's a lot of enzymes to be characterized, there's a lot of basic biochemistry to be done. Um, before we can really build metabolic models and have things which really represent reality. So that's um, where we are with kind of the annotations. So what we now have is um, we have a framework where <coughs> if, let's say, Lipid X has 50 specific data on a bunch of species, we can now map that onto our hierarchy and we can tell them what are the corresponding enzymes and, and structures and so on with our studies. So I think this might not look uh, great with this. The beamer is not such a, a high res one, so I apologize if these slides are a bit hard to read. Uh, so we put all this data into a database and a website. So some of the people who built this are sitting in the room. So um, I hope I won't make too much of a mess. Uh, so yeah, there we go. So I don't use a Mac, don't worry. Um, so we have we have this uh, interface for looking at. at Uh, so we have an interface um, that allows you to, to, to browse this hierarchy. So you can specify what's the class of lipid you're interested in, how many carbons, how many double bonds, and so on. So you can kind of start at the top and drill down. Um, so if you specify the class you're interested in, uh, okay, the class, uh, I don't know if this is visible for you, the class, the number of carbons here, and the number of double bonds. Um, so if you have uh, this particular class and this particular number of carbons, you're limited according to the known structures you have, and you're doing zero and seven double bonds in there. Um, so if you pick uh, five, you can then, <coughs> it actually gives you uh, the number of, of GAN subspecies or the actual number of structures which correspond to that output. So what you can then do is you can, um, start to drill down by clicking on these bars and you can see what the annotation is for these things. Um, so there's a really nice, uh, I don't know how visible that is for you. <coughs> there's a really nice little uh, display here. 
So you have the name of the lipid and uh, the numbers of carbons and double bonds. So there's kind of seven species at this level. We have these little icons which tell you what kind of annotation there is for those lipids. Um, you can see that two of these uh, seven have some annotation that the others don't. And this actually says location. So these have been li these are lipids which have been seen by mass spec. Um, so of the two of the seven possibles that exist according to known biochemistry, these seem to be the two. Um, you can then click out and see these things. Uh, this might be interesting to read. So this is a, a quite a high level discussion of a lipid. We have a definition which is generated computationally. So it tells you that this is a phosphatidyl proline. It's got a fatty alcohol. Uh, so what do, what does it really mean? There's 16 carbons, how it's linked, and so on and so forth. There's a little structure here, which might be a little bit difficult to see. Um, we have the, the parents in the hierarchy, what class it is in KB, what its analytical parent is, if you like. You can see the fragments, uh, sorry, the, the components. So you can go and look for lipids which have the same components. Or if you're interested in the metabolism of the components, you can go and look at that. Um, and you can see the children. So you can see there's some annotation for this particular lipid here. Um, and you can see, I don't know if that's visible to you, um, it's been annotated as being found in the monocyte. So, so we use for this kind of annotation, we have an ontology of cell lines called the CL cell line ontology. Um, so it's been seen in the human monocyte. Uh, there's a little link here um, that allows you to see the evidence for the annotation. So everything that's in there is based on experimental data and papers. And you can see a little excerpt here from the paper where this annotation was derived from, saying why we annotated it. And you get the PubMed and the figure. So it's figure three, table one. Uh, and, and this is a kind of evidence code ontology. And it tells you it's experimental evidence. So <coughs> if that's interesting to you, you, you can then flip back to the browse function. And you can see um, if you're interested in this particular lipid, you might want to go and look at the structures that correspond to that particular output. So you can now click on, click on this little icon to, to get only the children of that one. Uh, if you do that, you get this kind of collapsed view of the hierarchy, um, which shows you uh, here you have two possible structures for this lipid. Um, if you look at these little icons here, you can see there's a little colored dot. Uh, that's metabolism. So there's info on the metabolism of this lipid, but not the other one. Um, so you can then flip out and look at this particular uh, lipid. Now you have a, an actual defined structure for it. It's been mapped to lipid maps in KEBI. You can see these chemical representations of INGI and the smiles and the PGs and the CCG. Um, you get other data like the polymerase charge and so on. If you look at the metabolism, you can see that um, it's been annotated as, as being linked to this Rhea reaction and this particular protein. Again, we have the, the possibility to see the evidence. What this is telling us is that um, there's non, a known reaction which results in the hydrolysis of this lipid. Um, if you click on that evidence, you see the PubMed and, and the text from that paper again. It tells you why we did that annotation. Um, and if you, if you find these, these products interesting, either you can click on these. Uh, so we can see that it's liberating one of the fatty acids. If you know anything about lipid biology, you'll know that this uh, polyunsaturated fatty acid is dissolved in cell signaling. So that might be interesting to you. So we know that this thing could be found in a monocyte. It's dissolved in cell signaling. Um, you can then click out. Um, you can look at the components and how they're metabolized, like for this particular fatty acid. So you can click and go and look at that one. Um, and you can look at the metabolism of this particular lipid as well. Uh, what's interesting about this one is that there's several uh, cytochrome P4As, which actually metabolize this into, into signaling molecules, okay, which some of which are known to have roles in inflammation. Voila. Um, we can also, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> um, what we also provide is, is links also to activated forms of lipids. Um, so the metabolism of fatty acids, um, some of it occurs on, on isolated fatty acids and some of it occurs on uh, activated fatty acids, which are linked to other, other, other species like things like coenzyme A. Um, so we provide links to these, these forms of, of the fatty acid. So you can click out, uh, you can go to those, and you can see what's known about the metabolism of these. Okay? And this is all the data we curated specifically uh, for this project. It's only in the lipid database. Um, you can't find this in Unicorp or, or elsewhere, so you'll find it. 
So here you can see um, actually this activated form of this lipid being used by a variety of enzymes to make a variety of membrane lipids like propofol and methylamine and amines. Um, so that's kind of a, a whistle stop tour of how the database works. Uh, we have this um, kind of browse function which allows you to go in at a very high level, uh, drop down between the different levels and see what kind of annotation there is. Go all the way down to the structures if you like and then look at the metabolisms and the interactions of those particular structures. Um, there's other functions that I won't show you like a search for names or structures or masses and so on. All the kinds of kinds of things you may expect. <coughs> so that's where we are with the Swiss Lipid project now. Um, what we built or we tried to build is really uh, a framework which allows you to precisely describe information about lipids by using this funky kind of um, mass spec based nomenclature so it can be very hard to understand at the beginning um, so we effectively what we did was we took the lipid X um, set of lipids as a base to understand how to do this we then went to the pathways uh, and reaction databases that we worked on and we kind of reverse engineered that so you can now ask questions like where does my lipid occur what structures might exist for it and what are the reactions and the different parts that's what we built, um, how we built it. So I wanted to emphasize the role of so I wanted to emphasize the role of uh, bio curation. Um, so it's really kind of collective knowledge building. Um, so it's been a, quite a long job. It's involved reading a lot of papers, annotating a lot of proteins and a lot of enzymes and reactions. Um, what's been really great about this project, actually, it's not just the uh, fact that the Vital IP and Pinkpot have been been building this resource together. It's also uh, leveraging the expertise of the people in LipidX. Okay, so this is a, uh, it's a project which we would never have started on our own. It's not a problem we could have attacked without the input of the people working on the Lipidomics platform in LipidX. Um, so I think it's been a really nice example of a synergy between uh, bioinformatics group, bioinformation group, and people doing experimental biology. Um, <clears throat> so we built a resource which is fully mapped to LipidX. So actually, once we rebuild the hierarchy from scratch, we map it back onto all their lipids. Um, it maps other public databases like LipidMap, so we can now say what's the corresponding structure in LipidMap to LipidX, what's the corresponding reaction in this lipid to LipidMap, and so on. Uh, and it also links to MetaNet X. So MetaNet X uses RIA. The whole thing is built on RIA, so we have a mapping of the lipidomic data onto MetaNet X as well. So what we're planning uh, on doing next. We're still working on finishing uh, the last few lipid classes from, from LipidX, so we're not done yet. Um, we expect the database to approximately double in size uh, at the beginning of next year, so it will be something like 800,000 uh, lipids at that point. What we then plan to do is to move on to making, um, doing other targeted projects with other systems X uh, groups. Um, one thing we're interested in, and if anybody's working on lipids and they, they, they want to collaborate, please get in touch. Um, so we're, we're starting a collaboration with the people in PBX. Um, so they're studying the interaction of mycobacterium tuberculosis with, with the host. So this is kind of an interesting beast um, because it's extremely lipid rich compared to other bacteria like E. coli. As a large proportion of its genome is making lipids or metabolizing lipids. Um, its cell uh, wall or envelope is extremely complex and it has a lot of roles in pathogenicity and the persistence of the bacteria. So the lipids are extremely important there. Uh, and historically, actually the lipid uh, composition of the bacterium has been used as a means of, of typing the bacterium. So there's a, a whole branch of um, lipid biology and, and tuberculosis called tumor taxonomy. So people actually type strains based on the lipids they have. So they have some really extremely long and uh, quite bizarre lipids. There's, a, there's still, I think, a need for doing some kind of um, uh, lipid X style rebuilding of, of the lipidomic knowledge for this organism. So the current, the current state of the art is um, it's really kind of two databases which are really excellent, uh, which were built by two groups in the US. Uh, essentially, I think, using Excel macros to to build masses based on the addition of two carbon units. So these are guys who, who've built uh, databases of up to 5,000 um, theoretically predicted masses. 
so they think you might find in the, in the mycobacterium. Um, but these still only ex uh, explain about 20% of the data that you see in the genomic analysis of the mycobacterium. The best database at the current time is one called Lipid Bank in, in Japan, and it has about 10% of the possible structures for these kind of classes, uh, these kind of lipids. So we think there's about 2,000 of these in this uh, group of bacteria, which includes mycobacterium. Public databases usually have between 20 and 200. Um, so that's all I'd like to say about Sisyphid. Uh, what I'd like to do is really thank all the people who uh, played a part. Um, the curators um, at SwissPot and Vital IT, Lucilla, uh, Navilla, and Anne, and uh, Lucilla actually designed the logo. So thank you. Uh, I'd really like to acknowledge Rob, who's been there from the beginning. Um, he did an incredible amount of work on developing the database which meant also developing like tools for doing curation, building the website, and so on. He was helped by, by Lou, who really put into place this kind of um, tripartite browsing function. Uh, Dimitri uh, helped a lot in, in engineering the database. Um, so the database suddenly got extremely big. Uh, and he was very, uh, he was really instrumental in make, making sure it didn't slow down too much. Uh, and Anne is the person who built the hierarchy. He wrote the software with text on the structures, and it re regenerates these kind of MS uh, map check out maps. Um, I'd like to thank uh, Jizu, Howard, and Bacillus uh, from LipidX, um, and also uh, other people in the LipidX community, uh, some of the postdocs for their support and ideas, uh, especially Thomas and Ursula, and also the people in the VIA team. Um, the funding for this project uh, initially came from, from Systems X and SIB. Um, so this is what they call the Special Opportunities Project in Systems X. So most of the projects in Systems X are research technology development projects, or RTDs, which are quite big. This is something called the Special Ops Project. Um, so this is it's kind of a companion to LipidX, if you like. So the, the aim was really to uh, facilitate the reuse and the preservation of the data in LipidX. Um, so that was the, the Systems X uh, interest there. Um, and without them, we couldn't have got this, this thing off the ground. Um, also, funding from, from Bybit and from LipidX itself. Um, so uh, I'd like to thank you for your, your attention and your time. And if you have any questions, I'm happy to take them.